My name's Meg Kopka. I work for a company called Something New, actually a startup recruiting firm, um, but I work with uh, Mark and the team for the Enterprise Sales Forum because I talk to sales leaders every single day, I talk to sales people, marketing people, um, and I just really, really believe in the mission of sales. And we all know sales is hard, it is hard, so we always want to learn from each other. Um, so we put together this panel of amazing women for you tonight. So um, I hope you know it's interactive session. So um, Natasha Sakat, as Meg said, I am the VP of Demand Generation at Click Software. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I have been there now since the beginning of January, and um, so far so good. I came on board to really focus on the top of funnel, and so I am responsible for global field marketing. So running events, running email campaigns, trying to identify suspects and, and prospects within the marketplace. I run global sales development, so I have a team of SDRs in Massachusetts, in the UK, India, Latam, and uh, Melbourne, Australia, who are doing you know follow-up to marketing leads, but also target account calling. Um, and then I have sales enablement, so training and development of our primarily outside sales force, but also um, the sales development team. So they're kind of it's kind of a weird combination of things, but if you think about it, you know it really is tied to funneling pipeline, right, and, and kind of top of funnel. And a couple months ago, I had the opportunity to take on sale, uh, marketing operations. So I took that on very happily because I, I think back to kind of the theme of building the strong foundations. If you don't have a clean database, if you don't have clean processes, if Marketo's not set up, if you don't have the right technology stack, um, the rest of the activities start to be pretty painful for SDRs and for account executives. So I have those four functions. Um, Prior to coming to Click, I spent about a year and a half at uh, Turbonomic down in the uh, Copley area, and I was there um, VP of Sales Development. And then prior to that, I spent about 12 years at EMC Corporation, and I actually started as a sales development rep. We called them sales associates, and ended up into a um, inside sales rep position, then managing half the country, then going and living in Ireland and helping build out our EMEA team, and then coming back to build out all of our training and development programs, and then ultimately moved into a global sales strategy role and really building out global inside sales at EMC and um, global web and inbound. Um, my name is Annie Matthews. As Meg said, um, I'm the vice president of sales for the business applications and analytics team at Tech Target, as well as our networking and security media group at Tech Target. Um, so I run about half of the domestic sales organization for our team. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, through the conversations I've had here so far, it's been people have said, "Well, are they inside? Are they BDR? Are they field?" Um, and I think the three ladies here from Tech Target will be happy to say it. I'm like, wow, they're everything. Um, so on our team, we have um, everybody go full circle from prospecting um, to getting into new accounts that are within their territory, account management, um, as well as you know, handling the biggest accounts for our group as well. You know, one of the things that you know, in prepping for this conversation, that I thought was an important thing, and I had mentioned this to a couple of people that I spoke to prior to you know starting the panel, was. Um, the, the importance of um, going back, going back to step one and going back to the foundations that uh, Natasha mentioned. Um, I think all too often we forget about some of the things that make excep exceptional sales leaders as well as excep exceptional sales contributors across our organizations. And some of the things like you know the relatability factor um, of our talent as well as the idea of making sure that you're listening more than you're talking to your customers taking pauses, which is something admittedly I struggle with, um, and slowing down a bit to really understand what the pain points are from the prospects of customers we're speaking to. I think that that's a fundamental, a fundamental that we often overlook because we get in our, our ways. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was the idea of the introductory call, the idea of pairing back the really long pitch that talks about who you are and what you do as within your organizations and really redirecting that to be about the customer or the prospect. Um, I think that you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to what their needs are 
and I've talked a lot with these ladies about this idea of this 80-20 split and maybe it's 70-30, you know, 60-40 depending on your industry, who knows, but the idea of gaining and, and um, gathering more information on inter introductory sales discussions than we are talking about ourselves and what we can offer, um, making it more problem um, solving and, you know, problem oriented understanding and relating to the pain points of the customer and then having plenty of time in the next call or in that last 20 percent of the time on the introductory call to talk about how you can fill those holes for them um, so you know that's something that as you I think the big value of here being here tonight is networking and talking to one another um, but it to you know challenge you as you leave here as sales professionals to really um, you know go back to some of those basics and understand how you might be able to engage some of your prospects more um, by talking about yourself a little less. Um, thank you. This is just an honor to be here. It's really great um, for me. Also, my first time coming to one of these. But the interesting thing is that I actually met Mark a couple of years ago, two, a little over two years ago, at a dinner in New York where I was there for um, an event, and he mentioned, "Oh, I was thinking of pulling together these conversations where we can get groups of salespeople together and they can." kind of talk about issues, and I was like, that sounds fantastic, count me in. And uh, little did I know, he was actually gonna do this thing. I thought it was just an idea. I didn't know it was actually gonna happen, but, um, and now he's everywhere. So um, this, is a, this is a real honor to be here, and thank you guys for having me. Um, so I am currently with LogMeIn, and I'm responsible for the North American East account management team. So I have um, 14 teams that are devoted to the mid-market and five teams in the enterprise space. So we call them the majors at Hogman. Um, we are uh, roughly three, almost four months into a merger with GetGo. So the um, go-to meeting products, the go-to suite spun off from Citrix and we merged together with Logman. And it has been just joyous ever since. We actually have a couple people here who are former Logmeaners um, and now part of the, the combined company. But we have for the past three months really been figuring out how two very large and very dynamic organizations merge together and figure out how to learn from each other and sell together and share customers and share information. Um, and it has been just an amazing experience and we're really starting to see kind of the fruits of a lot of the labor um, that we've been engaged in over the past few months. But the topic that I wanted to speak to was really um, making sure that you are building your internal networks and that you are really connected and that everyone in your leadership structure and also your um, sales team is connected to marketing and to product and to all of the internal folks who are going to be able to provide you those nuggets of the really juicy information that you're going to need to have meaningful conversations with your customers. Um, we have found that the uh, uh, Logman was all Boston based and the get-go teams are spread out from Santa Barbara to Tempe to, Santa, to um, Raleigh, North Carolina where I have teams and we're still trying to figure out well, who does what. So if you need something from the engagement marketing team and it's up to a specific product, trying to navigate your way to figure out who that person is can be a challenge in and of itself, let alone getting the thing that you need developed. Um, we're trying to figure out how to share roadmaps and how to make sure that we really understand each other's customers because we have mixed up all the customer portfolios and we're also cross-selling and upselling all of our products. So um, it has been really fun, but it means that you have to stay connected and I think for the sales organization, I, I think we often felt like we were just asking, asking, asking. We wanted information from marketing, we wanted information from product, and we were forgetting that we actually have a lot to give as well, which is um, the fact that we talk to our customers all day long. And so making sure that we open up those feedback loops and we provide the forums where marketing can ask us questions about what we're hearing and product can get kind of immediate input on some of the stuff that we're, challenges that we're facing, um, has really helped us. We're just kind of smoothing, um, you know, getting all that started, but it has really helped us to make sure that um, we feel like we're extending an arm, you know, or, or an olive branch while we are also getting some of the stuff that we need to make the interactions with the customers really impactful. As Meg, um, as Meg mentioned, my name is MJ McCarthy, and I lead account management at a company called Everbridge. So, um, and my top topic's gonna be a little more around retention, where Amy's really focused on growth. My team is also focused on retention and growth of existing accounts, but I own the renewal space as well. So, um, Everbridge is a SaaS company that provides applications that literally save lives and keep businesses running. So it's super important, our investment in account management, because we have to make sure our customers are successful, or otherwise, literally, people can die if they don't know how to use our system, which is a really cool part of being with this company. It's really mission critical and has a feel good piece of it. I've been there for five years. When I when I first started, there were maybe 
three to four account managers. We were about $20 million in revenue. Um, we're now a team of 35 people strong. We're, we're, um, I've got varying levels of seniority um, based on vertical markets, and we went public eight years, I mean, eight months ago. So it was a super exciting ride to see um, how far we've come. But it's really been the focus on investing in our customer and our customer relationships. And so because my topic is more about the art of retention, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring really three key themes that have worked for us in terms of retaining customers. And one thing, I will not take credit for this, but someone on my team has, says this all the time. New business dates the customers and account management marries them. <laughs> and that's really what it feels like, because you are in the good, the bad, the ugly with your customers if you're doing this right. So the first, I think the first key theme of retention is that you cannot grow or renew a customer if they're not successful with what they initially bought. So you really, we say this all the time, but you really need to become their trusted advisor, their advocate, and make sure that you understand why they bought in the first place, what business drivers that they're trying to meet, what pain they're trying to meet, and then make sure your solution is actually doing that. And so the way we do that is through establishing a cadence of account reviews with our customers, right? So depending on the size and strategic importance of the customer, it can be a quarterly thing, it could be once a year, but it's a, it's a, it's a forum in which you collaboratively agree with them, okay, when we're gonna meet and what we're gonna talk about, and they're in it too, right? And so you're talking about what's working with the relationship, what's not working with the relationship. You understand what's changed in their business, right? And it's also a good opportunity for them to get insight into where you're going as a company. So oftentimes in account reviews, we're bringing our CTO or head of product. We're going through what's coming on the product roadmap. So that not only gives the customer kind of insight into where you're going and maybe give them the feeling that they have a say, <laughs> but it also can let other people, going to your point, Amy, let other resources at the company do some selling for you. So that's been a really key piece. We do not have a customer success team at Everbridge, so the account management team kind of acts as that, and they're also, you know, gold on retention as well as growth. So they take a, sometimes we maybe care too much about retention, but we take a vested interest to make sure our customer's successful, and that really has worked for us. I think the second key piece of retention is making sure you understand your territory and your book of business, right? And this goes for new sales as well as, as existing customer relationships. You need to know where the opportunity is, who, you know, where the strategic value is, where you're gonna, if you back into your number, right, where, where are the sales gonna come from? And not every customer necessarily needs to be managed the same way. Some need a ton of attention. Some need a quarterly account review, some might need twice a year, others might be just kind of automated tech touches, right, where it's a little more campaign based. But I think really having a plan and knowing who, who needs what attention when is really important for successful retention and growth of your territory. And then the third thing that some people in the room have probably heard this term, but it's super important, this, this concept of the three by three, to always have three different contacts at three different levels of an organization, and it's really important with existing customers. Because if you've got a champion who all of a sudden gets fired or gets hit by a bus or leaves job, your, you know, your retention is, at, you know, the, the account's at risk. And this is it, really important for new business sales too, right? You wanna have multiple engagement levels. The more, contacts that are engaged, the higher the retention, but also the more mind share you have within a company, right, with more people knowing your brand and what you're doing for them, the more growth opportunities are there. So I would say those kind of, and I think you can apply those for new business and, and retention, but it's been really successful for us at Everbridge. But I love account management, I love retention, I love customer relationships, so I'm happy to answer any questions around, around that. So the first thing is, are you hiring the right skill set? Do you even know the skill set that you need? Because it's different when you're going after very complicated, large accounts, you know, multi-threading, understanding their business. The techniques you use are also different, right? So one is kind of, do you have the right talent in place? Two would be, do you have the right, um, the right infrastructure around it? So do you have the goals properly defined? 
do you have the right roles? Do you have the right handoffs? Because there's only certain things you can expect a BDR to do versus an account executive, right? So kind of how have you built that process? From a systems perspective, when you want to get into larger accounts, you have to get really, really, really smart about not just what the company is doing, but also those individuals' um, personal drivers. So when you start thinking about it, there's a bunch of different technology stack vendors that will automate or you know, kind of roll up your sleeves and, and, and follow people yourself on LinkedIn or follow, you know, set up Google Alerts and things like that. Um, so then I would think about the, the kind of technology piece of it and how are you, are you going after them. But ultimately, and then kind of the next piece would be the plan. So what's the plan? And what I've seen as a general rule is less is more. So rather than trying to just broad brush, okay, everybody, like let's go sell some big accounts today, it's what are the most important accounts where either from a vertical or industry perspective, your value prop is especially strong, or where you have um, executive relationships in the C-suite or VP level, you know, but really, really get focused. And then it's all hands on deck. So what is marketing doing? What is sales dev doing? What are your AEs doing? What are your partners doing if you're in a channel model? But, um, but then you basically have your plan, and then the last piece is reporting. So how are you going to report on success? What even are the KPIs you're trying to drive? And then, and then tracking. I mean, the, the first thing is the obvious, which is understanding what their problem is that you're ultimately you guys solve and going after them in a way that you're providing some value right out of the gate, right? So um, as you look at an, uh, a communication structure for these people, you're going to want to do some due diligence via LinkedIn and some other social channels. Obviously, you're going to look on Twitter, etc. You, I mean, I absolutely recommend that you um, encourage the sales reps to spend time on their website and understand where they, what their value proposition is too in the market and what their competitive set is. Maybe you guys have a good win, a strong win from somebody from a competitive perspective, you know, and maybe you don't. Maybe you have to, you know, flub that a little bit to make it sound, uh, make it sound good. Um, and there's a level of confidence that has to go in it regardless, right? Um, but I think that the big thing is really, um, you know, catering to what those pain points are, spending a lot of time asking them and making them understand what makes you guys different. So what is the value as being a partner that your, your guys or girls are going to put forth? Um, we just instituted a new SDR function within our organization where we actually just put forth different email copy that basically starts at, um, you know, very introductory, very high level communication on how we can help our customers, um, assuming they have specific pain points, you know, kind of insert pain point, et cetera. But it's still more well thought out in that generic communication that you tend to see from, you know, sales reps of other organizations or automated types of um, deployments that get sent. And then basically there's a mid-tier of we know what you do and we, um, we, can, you know, we can relate to you, but we need some more information from you. And then the last piece of it is we are actually putting forth some data to support that we have in fact the people that would be interested in, in your solutions. So what I would recommend is that you give, you, you know, you equipped your sales organization, ultimately if you have a sense of weariness on their ability to just do that on their own, with different phases that, you know, depending on what they know or what they're able to extract from various sources, they can plug into that different communication strategy. Um, you know, leveraging marketing materials at large is going to be really crucial. Um, and I just think the, that the idea of building relationships and making sure that they're, you know, your sales reps are connecting with these people uh, on a human level to figure out what, you know, what the, what the holes are and where you can help build the gaps. I think that that's kind of your best bet um, going forward, for sure. I think Challenger sounds probably like it's absolutely the right thing. I think once you get people into some sort of a framework or a structure, um, and I'll just speak from some of the experiences of going through with LogMeIn now, which is the former LogMeIn was all Sandler. Um, former Gecko teams were um, force management, or it's now called growth by the command of the message, command of the sales. So we're trying to figure out how to have an artful sales conversation where half the sales reps are doing one thing and half the, and so we're trying to take the best of both, right? Um, and ultimately come up with something that will where we can path customers through in a, in a similar way. Um, but I think, so once you've sort of settled on that, it will, it should then help guide the conversation. So if people are a little bit all over the map or not sure when they should introduce the data or the specifics <coughs> or when they should just ask a lot of questions, um, 
I think that should provide some of the framework, and it, it, I would act, make sure that you set that out as an objective for something that you would want to conquer with putting in um, a sales methodology training. And um, I think that there's when you're having a nuanced conversation like that, and you want to just ask a bunch of questions, um, making sure that there is a path to the yeah. questions as sure. well. Um, and that you can always sort of sum it up in the end with the typical, well, you know, what I've heard you say, Mr. Customer, is that you're looking for X, Y, and Z. Um, I think asking questions around the pain and the problem, um, as long as you can get people talking and someone has done homework and they know that this act, the solution that you provide probably could um, fulfill some of the needs of the customer, then I, I'm certain that it would be an impactful conversation. I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, and I think, you know, in addition to, to both of what you said is how many people are actually doing homework on their prospects before they call them? Like real homework, like Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. You know something personal about them, right? You are able to connect with them on a level that, you know, if they know that a salesperson is calling them, they don't want to pick up the phone. Why would they want to pick up the phone? To get another pitch? Right, so there's absolutely zero reason for anybody to be going into a call without doing their due diligence and homework and So, um, so I, I, I think there's a couple of ways to, to break this out. So when you look at, um, we just rolled out the growth play force management, um, and that has a big focus on starting with the buyer, right? So if you look through the buyer's view, and this kind of ties into, I think, your question as well, is you know, what do you know about them? What's relevant um, based off of their vertical? What are likely issues? Um, what are trends that are happening within the market based on their geography? Are there things that are happening? And then based off of the individual that you're targeting, are they typically going to be gold on reducing cost or is it more about growth or, you know, what, what are those things? And there's some assumptions that you can start to make. And I think it's really about um, the planning process. So from my experience, is it's as much the execution as it is the plan of do you actually know what those questions are that you want to ask, right? Because depending on the answer to that, you would take your call left or you would take your call right. And then have you also planned what your unique value propositions are, right? And what's that, what's in it for them for why they should want to take the next step with you. And so um, as an example right now, you know, we're looking at our brand in Asia Pacific. And you know, does anyone know Click? Yes, no, maybe kind of depends, and one of the things we're looking at is, is providing value add in the form of what are um, successful field service organizations doing today. So companies with field service, we're a field service management software company, and so we're saying, you know, we're actually doing a survey of the market, and we're going to dissect it and split it out for specifically that region, and so we can create valuable, valuable content that will say, here are the trends. Here's what people are thinking about. Here's where they're going with it, et cetera. So I think it's um, there's things that the sales rep themselves can do to kind of structure in a winning environment or an environment with a higher likelihood to win. But then there's also back to kind of pairing and teaming up <coughs> with other functions where you need to have that reference account. You know, you need to have the marketing collateral and content to be able to support what you're trying to do. I think it's a tie-on that what you said and also for the um, gentleman with the SaaS platform that sounds like it saves energy costs for buildings. That's right. It seems like you would be really able to make a strong business case. Yeah. So I think it's so instead of it seeming like an interrogation, maybe the call should be about offering to work together with them to build a cut business case. So you're going to prove it to them, right? So we at, at Everbridge we have one example is a you know we work typically with disaster recovery, business continuity, emergency management, but we have an IT platform, right? So we've expanded our suite of services, but we get into IT by basically like work with us. We're going to build an ROI that shows you how you can cut X amount of costs or X. X amount of you know mean time to resolution for your issues that could affect thousands of your customers, but they they see something's in it for them, right? So you need to have help from your product marketing team or other internal resources to help you build an ROI calculator or whatever it is. But I think if you go in it with them, 
you get their attention if you're if you're going to show them a, a way that can save costs in, in a tangible way, not just a pitch. You know? mm -hmm. So. Lots of side-by-side -side coaching and also make sure that you're leveraging some sort of recording tool so that you can actually play back conversations for them. You know, it's okay to let them sort of mess up, or, but if you can then play it for them and say like, hey, here's where it sounds like you missed this or it sounds like you missed that, um, I think it's really helpful. And um, we also leverage a tool actually at Logman called Allego where we, are, we record conversations and then the manager can go in and put notes where like you nailed it or gosh, this sounds a little bit challenging right. here or you kind of missed the point on that or got you totally, you forgot to, you, know, you didn't respond to this thing that the customer said, which you clearly could have. And so that has been um, pretty helpful as well. Awesome. If anyone has gone through Sandler, like customers mm -hmm. have gotten used. To, like we've yes. we've seen people, heard people say, "Are you putting me through the pain funnel?" Which is the worst, right? Yeah. So like, I think you have to, especially new kids out of college that are lear just learning sales. You have to make sure you're urging them to be comfortable in it. And it's not, you know, get comfortable with the script, but you're not, it's, you, you gotta go with the flow, right? Yeah. You gotta tailor it so it doesn't yeah. sound like you're using a sales methodology. It's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing we, um, there were a couple of people that raised hands that they were sales leaders, and I think my big thing from a sales leadership perspective perspective is transparency. Let's not wait till the review at the end of the year or the mid-year and let's address things as, as it's happening. So um, I recently had a rep, we were at a meeting and they're fidgeting in their seat the whole meeting and you're like, how do I stop them from fishing? Um, and that's the type of thing that you just have to address it right away. And there are small, and then you can kind of, you know, the next meeting you see he or she starts to fidget, you give them the eyes and they remember, right? And it's just a little bit of that repetition and the learning. Um, and I think so often sales managers wait till that review and hope that they remember these things come up and it just doesn't happen as naturally. So um, I think we really need to challenge our sales leaders or if you're you know, sales um, professionals, account executives, BDRs, et cetera, um, you know, ask your, your managers for feedback more often. I have a lot of reps that hold me accountable to giving them feedback and professional advice. Um, just as much as I like to proactively give it to them. And I think that that's really important and that's something that you as individual contributors can also control um, for your own development. So I think when it comes to coaching, I, I'll, I'll speak, I love coaching, but I will say we've been, I'm at this company that went from, as I said, 20 million to public this year. So I think last year I had really 28 direct reports, like crazy, we're better now. But I think a lot of you are probably with small startups that don't have, that might not have a lot of, maybe there's an issue with management span of control. So I would say I think the, the best reps are the ones that really own their career and they own their um, improvement, right? So I think the best reps seek coaching, right? And I say that all the time. My door is open, my Skype's on, text me, get in my face and say, and if you, you know, if you say, I've got a really good call to your manager, can you listen to it? And I think it's, you need to own the fact that you want to get better and reach out more, not expect the coaching to come to you. And I think you see that in really successful reps as they seek it out. And the second thing is to find a mentor, and we've tried to bring up a Mentor, mentorship program within the various sales teams at Everbridge, but somebody who's been around it just can be your buddy. So, and we, I think that's it's worked really well. It's more day to day. It's not your manager micromanaging you, or you're you're scared to get feedback there, but it's more peer. So, whether there's a program where you can just find somebody, and it's typically the, the ones that are successful who try to hitch your cart to their wagon, right, and and learn from them. I think that that's been helpful, but. I think it's really owning your own career and owning the fact that you want to get better, so seek out the coaching as much as it will come to you. That's great. And I, would, I, I have a, a similar um, philosophy, and then I also say just in terms of owning your own coaching, or if you want to approach somebody to mentor you, if you come to someone, even very busy person with 28 direct reports, or even in a small organization, and say, I actually want to work on this, and I'd like to meet with you every other week yes. for the next quarter, can you help me with that? Nobody would say no to that. Right. When people come to me with stuff like that, and I'm like, awesome. Right. Lay out the plan. Find me every Wednesday for half an hour. Yeah. Um, and when you just make it very digestible, 
I've also leveraged that technique myself with things that I wanted to learn, especially being new at LogMeIn. There were a lot of people that I needed to get to know and a lot of stuff that I wanted to understand about just how the business is structured. And so when you approach someone and say, can you meet with me four times over the next year, like everybody says yes, like they just do. You make it very simple. Uh -huh. And it's also hard to say no to that. on the skinny branch. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, where to start on this one? So I think, um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> like, how do I not offend 50% of the audience? Um, so I, from, from my standpoint, I think women are underrepresented in sales. I mean, that's not I think, like that's a fact that women are underrepresented. Um, so I think it's it's hard to say definitively who's better because if you don't have a huge sample size, it gets into, well, this one was great, but this other one was horrible. Um, what I've seen over the years is that women will tend to be very successful in sales when they have good mentorship and when they have a good environment, work environment. So I've worked at really excellent work environments where I had both male and female mentors that helped shape my career and my decisions of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to accomplish and that has helped me to, to kind of get to the executive ranks. But I've also seen really bad environments where women didn't were not successful and um, you know there was a lot of bad behavior and a lot of um, just things not, not being great. So I, I think it, it really depends on the environment that you're in and, and to a certain extent, the, the leadership team as well. You know, and do you have an executive team that cares about this? Do, you know, is it something that they're um, really taking your account of? And then for, and then I think another point would be, so you know, I have three little kids and when you start to think about maternity leave, you start to think about you know, how do you manage the working hours and if you're in a job where you have to travel, there's also those limitations where as, as a woman, I think it's, you know, data shows that women take more of the burden on at home versus, versus spouses. Um, and so I think that's another variable to take into account. But from my standpoint, and people are people, humans are human. So, you know, if you have the, the natural aptitude and, and personality and skill set to be successful, you'll be successful. Um, yeah, I mean, the children's books. Do <laughs> 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 I know a lot of people are probably thinking now about shoe dogs, but the founder of Phil Knight. It's really, yeah. it's worth it's shoe worth dog. Reading. Yeah, shoe dog. Yeah, it's good. It's a good. It's a quick read. It's a fast read. Um, I know. In your spare time, but, um, but it, I actually just found it really impactful just for what he was able to accomplish, and uh, it was I enjoyed it. Good read. So I'm just going off the top of my head, which was an article today about Uber. Yeah, you did. And did you, did you say? Oh my God! No, you said. I, I, I wanted to read it. Yes. Yeah, so it's really it, it just especially as we're talking about diversity, but it was basically this article on LinkedIn that talked about um, you know with software companies especially this what's going on, like the Uber story, right? It's rampant, but Uber just got caught. Mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting story about yeah. it, or just around this, mm -hmm. you know, harassment and uh, all the stuff that, you know, that you just Google it. Is that <laughs> an Ashton Kutcher write that? Today? No. I thought there was something about, he was but, one of the first But they had a lot of examples, but a lot of examples about what's happening, other tech target, I mean, tech, uh, <laughs> tech, 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 tech companies around this terrible problem that's happening around discrimination and sexual yeah. So it was an interesting article. Gosh. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking because I actually circulated for the past two days two different um, videos by Jill that Jill has done that I thought were interesting. Yeah, that I thought was interesting. Um, one of the things was, you know, the idea of the reason um, when you when you're called calling the reason for my call is versus, you know, I'm Andy Matthews and I'm Protect Target and we're an IT publishing company and, and all that kind of stuff. So I really enjoyed that as a takeaway. 
Um, and then she had another article. What did I send you guys today? Do you remember? I don't put poor Christine on the spot. That was, that was one of them. Yeah, yeah. I have these two. Too. She I watch her little. Two, I love her two-minute snippets. Um, so I've been really enjoying them. Um, and then there was another thing posted um, by Max and Sales Hacker about the idea of um, going back and looking at your goals for the week and what you accomplished and being proud of your accomplishments and. Um, and I felt that that was really inspiring. So I, I think I've commented or shared all of those on LinkedIn over the last, you know, what, 12 hours, being um, the crazy pants that I am. Um, so you can find any of those there. Um, the one that I really love that's um, SDR specific is Morgan Ingram has the SDR Chronicles. So if you guys haven't checked it out, totally check it out. Um, they're like a series of, when he interviews people, it's probably 20 to 25 minutes on different topics that are relevant for either career development or specific skills to get into accounts or technologies that you can use. Um, and then he does kind of his own ruminations as well about being um, now a, a manager of SDRs. So I really love that one. It's a channel, he has a, a website and a channel on YouTube. So I really, those are great. Oh, and I'm and, um, taking a look at on Instagram sales humor. That's always a good one too, just yes. to get a little bit of a jolt during the day and make a little bit of laugh laugh, especially at the end of the quarter. We all have to laugh. Yeah, we, yeah. we need to laugh. Gotta, like, can't it, take it, it too seriously. Too <laughs> all right, so unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Um, you know, So for everybody who, the familiar faces that come all the time, but for all the newcomers, I hope that you've gotten, you received what you wanted for today, that you can go on and be inspired um, and continue to come to these meetups. So check out the page. We have two July events, one out in Burlington, which is about building real relationships. Um, we have another one, all with data analytics, coming up as well in July. So check it out. We have topics for the rest of the year, but I hope you continue to come join us because I want to thank the panel, too. I, want, I mean, Mark Birch started this. We have now, what, 22 chapters? Um, you know, this is all a volunteer thing, right? So Mark okay. Birch has inspired us so much that um, he's, he's <laughs> wrangled us, and uh, we all really believe in what we're doing. So uh, continue to network with each other, uh, LinkedIn, and um, be able to, I think, conversations and being open. and. We're all human beings and we all have, it, it's safe and we all have questions and, and we can all help each other. And I think that at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. So thanks for coming everybody.